right, I just wanted to add this little addendum to the lecture that I already had posted here on operons. So we talked about how prokaryotes can control their genes, turning them on and off as needed using the operon model. But in eukaryotes, our DNA is a lot more complex and our protein synthesis process is also a lot more complex. So we can control it on multiple levels. And so one of the levels, just going through eukaryotic control, is the pre-transcriptional level, meaning we can prevent transcription from ever happening. So remember, our DNA, unlike bacterial, is wound around histones, which are these blue things in the picture. These are proteins that our DNA coils around when it's chromatin. And it turns out that our DNA can either be really tightly coiled, which is what you're seeing here, this is heterochromatin, or it can be loosely coiled euchromatin. And there are certain transcriptional factors that can cause the DNA to coil up more tightly or less tightly. But the point is, when it's coiled up tightly as heterochromatin, remember, protein synthesis required the DNA to open up, and then the mRNA is made here from one side of that DNA template. Well, if, if you have like a stack of books on a desk, there's no way you're going to be able to open one of those books to read it. So think about tightly coiled DNA as a way of preventing particular genes from being copied at a particular time. One of the things that will tighten or loosen the DNA has to do with functional groups that can be added. So methyl groups or methylation of the DNA. We know that this happens as you age. We also know that this can be different in males and females. This is where genomic imprinting comes from. Is that in the sperm versus the egg, certain DNA segments are methylated or not methylated. And so when DNA is methyl, heavily methylated, you can see that that coils it up. And again, that would prevent it from being copied. There's another type of group called an acetyl group, and acetyl groups bind to the histones. And apparently when DNA is acetylated, it helps to loosen it so that genes can be expressed. So again, we may have factors that cause our DNA to become methylated or acetylated and this would allow our DNA to be copied or not copied at a particular time. We also have activators. Uh, this diagram kind of shows what an activator would do. So it's a protein factor that would help mRNA bind. So if an activator was missing in a particular spot, it might prevent transcription from happening or it would not happen as quickly or as often. Another thing that we know is that we also have these things called enhancers, and these are genes in other locations. And this diagram sort of shows how an enhancer works here on the left. It actually causes the DNA to fold up so that here's RNA polymerase. Remember, that's the enzyme that's going to bind so that mRNA can be made. And notice how the DNA has to fold up with these special proteins with this enhancer uh, sequence and if that doesn't fold up properly, RNA polymerase can't bind, and then those genes may not get copied. We also have levels of control like this picture, which is cut off at the bottom. But in the stickleback, for example, you've got this gene called the PIT1 gene, and it's a growth gene. And when the growth gene is active, all it really does is it activates, it makes a protein that activates other genes. Now, if it makes a particular, um, protein, for example, here in the pelvis, the pelvic switch is in the on position, but not the pituitary or the jaw. So in the pelvis, we don't get a jaw growing. The growth gene turns on. It activates only the pelvic switch and a spine forms here. In other tissues, in the jaw area, the same PIT1 gene is active, but the switch that's on is the gene for the jaw, and so a jaw develops. And so in the eye, it's a different gene. Uh, in the pituitary, uh, it's a different one. So my, my point is, in this case, we have one gene making a protein that activates other genes. And we can control uh, at different levels in different types of tissues which genes are activated by this protein and which genes are not, causing different things to happen. We also have post-transcriptional control. So remember, after transcription happens in a in a eukaryote, there's a processing step. Remember the mRNA gets a cap and a tail and it gets spliced by these things called spliceosomes. Well, it turns out we can have something called alternative splicing, meaning we can have the same original mRNA 
but lysosomes can cut it two different ways. So in this case, they cut out the green portion, and now we get this protein in translation, or we can cut out the yellow portion, we get this protein after translation. So we basically have one mRNA that can be cut and spliced together in multiple ways, and that's called alternative splicing. So this can control what proteins we make. Translational control, remember that once the mRNA leaves the nucleus and goes to the ribosome, it has a cap and a tail that help prevent it from getting broken down, but we do know that enzymes will ultimately break it down. So how long does that mRNA last? Is it hours? Is it minutes? Is it days? And so the number of these enzymes that we make can determine how long that mRNA is active and how many proteins it makes. Because technically, remember the ribosomes are lining the rough ER, and you could have an mRNA that literally does this. It feeds through several ribosomes, and each one makes another copy of the protein. And so you might have an mRNA sequence that lasts a really long time and feeds through many ribosomes and makes lots of proteins, or it's degraded by enzymes fairly quickly and hardly makes any. And then there's post-translational, meaning after the protein's made, it still has to fold up. It may need to get modified by the rough ER and have a lipid added to it or a sugar added to it or get cut or get matched up with another um, segment to make quaternary structure. Or the protein itself, even after it's made, is still inactive. For example, pepsinogen, an enzyme that you make to digest proteins in your stomach is not activated unless you also make hydrochloric acid and drop the pH of the stomach, and that activates the pepsinogen into pepsin. So you can actually control the proteins there too. So bottom line, eukaryotes are much more complicated, and we have all these levels of control where we can turn our genes on and off, or even if they're on, turn them on a lot or a little, and even if they're on a lot, control how much protein that makes or what the structure of that protein is going to be or whether that protein gets activated or not, etc. So here's a sample question. I told you that on the AP exam, you would typically not have to just label an operon from scratch or they're not going to ask you, what does the lac operon do or anything like that? But here's a sample of something they can give you. So I'll read this to you. The lac operon and E. coli consists of genes that code for enzymes necessary for the breakdown of lactose. When lactose is absent, the operon is inactive because a repressor binds to a site in the lac operon. When lactose is present, lactose molecules bind to the repressor protein, causing the repressor protein to dissociate from the binding site. In the absence of glucose, a preferred energy source for bacteria, the protein CAP, CAP, binds to a regulatory site near the lac promoter to activate transcription of the lac operon and then they give you some symbols. And now notice what they ask you. So you didn't have to know what the lac operon did, they tell you. You don't have to know what polymerase looks like, they tell you. But now look at the question. In the diagrams, the horizontal line represents the lac operon and the bent arrow represents the transcription start site of the lac operon. Which of the following diagrams best represents the scenario in which lactose is available to the cell and glucose is absent. So we want glu no glucose and lactose available, and they want to know what's going to happen. Okay, so we have four choices here. So it specifically says that when glucose is absent, the protein cap binds to a regulatory site. So this can't be the answer, because guess what? The protein cap is not bound to the regulatory site. So see how this does not match the description they're giving us. So that knocks out that possibility. Okay, then it says that lactose, when it's present, it binds to the repressor protein and causes that repressor protein to dissociate from the binding site. So let's look for lactose bound to the repressor. So it can't be this, because lactose is not bound to the repressor. And it can't be this, because lactose here is bound to polymerase. Here it is. Lactose is bound to the repressor. It has been removed from the binding site. And now polymerase, they said this is where it starts, polymerase is sliding down this operon, making an mRNA. So you see what I mean about these questions. You really don't have to know the parts, but you need to be able to read the scenario and match up which one of these pictures matches
their explanation of how this particular operon works. And they can give you an operon you've heard of before, or they can give you a brand new one. But if you can read the scenario and you understand the vocabulary that they're using, you should be able to match up the pictures.